Ewan was a, an auto worker and activist in the CW for 12 years, working in the Oakville Ford plant. Uh, he's a graduate of many universities, uh, of McMaster University and also the, Glaber, the Global Labor University. He's currently teaching at McMaster School of Labor Studies and is also a member of the Greater Toronto Workers' Assembly. And I should say that he is accompanied by his lovely daughter, Natalie, who I'm going to go sit with in a, just a minute. Um, our six and a half year old comrade, so the, the, the future is bright. I just, I just want to tell these two guys that watching Madison online has been incredible. It, it's been an inspiration. It's been incredible, guys. It's, like, I'm not the only one who's feeling that. Like, it's, it's, it, it really has been remarkable to watch. Like, like you were describing that, that kind of that uh, unwelcome patience, <laughs> patience not by choice, right? And, and when you are actually presented with something in front of you, it's, it's, it's dramatic and it's incredible the effect that it has. Um, so me, I just finished, I uh, just wrapped up last week uh, teaching this course in labor studies at McMaster, which is mostly people out of the working class movement. It's mostly working class students who take these kinds of courses, a few commerce here and there, but um, it's about battle ideas in these contexts, so it, that's always enjoyable. But the course was Labor and Globalization, a second year course for students at Mac. And we integrated what was going on in Wisconsin to the work in the course. We watched that video that the young guy Matt put together uh, that had the arcade fire tuned to it. So we watched that and these guys could see people their age engaging in this kind of stuff. And that really provoked them to reflect on it. We had some space to talk about, well, why don't workers just accept uh, like right-wing solutions? Why are they responding in this kind of way? So it offered, uh, offered us a bit of space to do that kind of stuff. Um, in addition to that, in order to link it in a deeper way to the globalization stuff, we put up pictures of, of workers in Wisconsin holding up signs saying, it took 18 days in Cairo, how long is it going to take here? So they're thinking about what's going on in Cairo. And then there was the picture of that young brother in the streets of Cairo saying, one struggle, Wisconsin workers were with you. So we go sequencing and linking those pictures to, to the debates and what's going on. And like I was making the case to those students, about 60 of them, how lucky they were. Like, you guys are lucky that this stuff is going on right now. You guys are so fortunate that you have the time and space to really interrogate and play with these ideas and get engaged with this kind of stuff right now at the age you're at. But to be clear, they're not the only ones that are lucky. Um, the entire labor movement in the US is lucky. The entire labor movement, all of us here are lucky. People may not have been sleeping and to challenge that notion I think is a really, is a really, good, uh, is a really good strategy. People weren't sleeping, but people have been provoked. Workers and students have been provoked. And workers and students in Wisconsin have accepted that provocation, they've accepted that challenge. Um, the labor movement in some ways, in, in, in uh, contentious ways, in conflicted ways, has accepted that challenge. And, but it's not only those guys in Wisconsin that have been provoked, and not only in the US, people all over, right, have been talking about this, and have been excited by this. And it's not only looking at a level of militancy that's different than what's happened in the past, but it's also a little bit expanding or pushing out the boundaries, the often self-imposed boundaries about what's possible. So pushing the limits of what we think is possible. That's really what that's one of the dramatic things, I think, one of the things that's deeper that has gone on here. And that's one of the most inspiring things. But with inspiration comes investment. We got invested in that struggle watching it despite the distance. Um, it's amazing how much of it we could see with people walking around with live cameras inside the Capitol building. And we sit in our living rooms and watch it. It's, it's incredible that we can actually participate in that kind of way um, and be inspired in that kind of way. But to be clear, that class war from above that's going on in Wisconsin, we felt like that was class war from above on us as well. That war was declared against us here um, as much as it was against anybody else. Uh, so when we watched the pressure getting increased on workers and students in Wisconsin, and we watched them respond, again, we became inspired. The workers were matching the increase in the pressure. That occupation of the Capitol building, even though the US media doesn't want to call it an occupation, how often does that happen where like, a public building like that is occupied, and, and actually people start taking care of themselves in a basic solidaristic kind of way that is rare for us to see? The demonstrations out front and the stuff inside, but how that kept growing each time. It kept getting bigger and bigger. It wasn't dissipating. Um, workers organizing demonstrations at the recently opened lobbying office for those Koch brothers. The Koch brothers, right? Koch. They, they, yeah. they, put their, uh, <laughs> they put their office, their new lobbying office downtown there. People went there, started organizing demonstrations, right? Importantly, there was a resolution passed by the South Central Labor Council, so the Regional Labor Council. 
And this is right after the budget, right? Where these guys at the Labor Council said, you know what? We are going to call a general strike if this legislation passes. That was the content of the resolution that they passed. And they also said, let's talk to some of those guys in Ontario about the days of action. Let's talk to other workers who have had experience with general strikes. Let's start doing some of that kind of research work in preparation, is what they said. So we watched and we were inspired by the escalation. And then we shared that frustration when they split the budget piece from the legislation and ran the legislation through. We felt that. We felt that deeply here. Um, not as deep as you guys, I, I, <laughs> I can say, uh, uh, for sure, to be sure. But we felt it as well. And then when we were watching, many of us were disappointed. Where's the general strike? You guys passed the resolution, everybody's been talking about it, but it didn't happen. So the legislation passed, but then that was sort of the contingent piece for the general strike, and it didn't happen. So that kind of forced a lot of us to quit with the romanticization and start interrogating this stuff a little bit deeper, start engaging with it in a, more, in a deeper way, more seriously, more critically, and looking at what's actually going on there. I mean, seriously, if, if the official labor movement had to call a general strike in response, that would be in defiance of upwards of 100 years of US labor history. So when we start thinking critically about what the possibilities are, things start to make a bit more sense. But from an outsider's perspective, in many ways, as being up here, what has been accomplished first, and then what can we learn, and how do we link it to what's relevant for the context here? In terms of what's been accomplished, the seriously creative and deep feedback that's been, or uh, fight back, that's been organized in a very short time um, is an amazing and inspiring accomplishment. The people that are actually there, the students and workers you guys have described, the public sector, private sector workers having meetings, opening up democratic space, you guys got cops and firefighters to join you? Like, what's up with that? Seriously, cops. Like, there was a, uh, the chief of police refusing to be the palace guard and, and kick people out. Despite the, the sort of racist context that you can describe, that's anti-imperialist language to say we refuse to be the palace guard. There are implications for those kinds of comments, um, whether they're understood at the time or not. But beyond the actual, the people who were there, what are they doing? What kind of tactics? That occupation and taking care of each other in that basic way, that's what we saw in the streets of Cairo. That's what we've seen in these other places, is people learning on the fly how to take care of each other and sustain each other in a basic way. Amy Goodman does this Democracy Now! show, and she does some video and some uh, stuff you can just download an MP3. But she had this young woman go on a tour of the occupation. And this is amazing, right? We can look at this stuff. But one of the things that really struck me in terms of new ways of organizing was this young woman goes up and she goes up to this sort of central coordinating table that's in the Capitol building there that people have set up. And she goes up to this, uh, it's like a, a flip chart. And there's updates for people on what's going on. And she says, you know, it's kind of like, uh, like a paper version of Twitter. So this is like, this is an innovation, right? It's the paper version of Twitter. And I was like, look at the innovation, right? This is inspiring, guys. This is amazing, right? You guys are getting your stuff together. Um, so, I, but there was also, like, there was a, a speech that I saw given by one of the elected leaders in the, uh, in the teachers' union. And he was actually, he was being self-critical. He was being self-critical of the movement, not of him as an individual. And he was saying, you know what? We've fallen down, folks. We have fallen down because when we're provoked in this kind of way, our rank and file, our members, are no longer familiar with what the basic tools of resistance are. That is a gap on our side that we cannot let, we cannot sustain that gap. We have to fill that gap and, and, and accept this as a challenge and an opportunity so that we are not confronted with in this kind of way again where our members don't know the basic tools of how to fight back. Despite these basic kind of solidaristic responses that we see. Again, in terms of what's been accomplished, the sustained pressure inside and outside is really significant, I think. And, and also the educational materials that keep cropping up, like people putting together stuff and distributing it and, uh, and debating it and how organic that is and, and the fact that we have access to some of that has been uh, is, uh, a significant accomplishment in terms of production. And I think in terms of bigger picture, the, the kind of popular refocusing, and I think, Adam, you mentioned it in a, in a sort of different way, in a slightly different way, the, but this popular refocusing on the role of the labor movement as a defense strategy, as the most significant defense strategy for the working class against neoliberalism. This is, a, this, is one of, this is our basic tool, right? And so workers thinking about that as their basic tool in a way that hasn't happened for a while. I mean, it, it wasn't about wages and working conditions. And although the trade union response initially was to say, yeah, those 6 to 12% wage cuts and, and uh, getting rid of holidays, whatever, we'll give you all that stuff because if you say it's about the budget, but let us keep collective bargaining. It really wasn't about money in some ways, right? It was about the right to collective bargaining. 
Um, but it was also about public sector workers delivering public services and workers framing it in the sense that we're defending the administration delivery of public services. Um, and that's really significant for public consciousness. And I think even more significantly, this is the first major fight back in the homeland of these neoliberal ideas to this iteration of class war from above. This is the first major one. And so it's really significant in terms of what's been accomplished in that respect. There's space now, space that we can see from a distance for socialist and anarchist, the socialist and anarchist left to start injecting ideas into these different meanings. Like you said, people have time and space to sit down and interrogate some of these ideas and learn from each other. So for, to sort of promote those ideas and help them spread in the working class is really, uh, is really an accomplishment. And then also, like, the substantive, I think, links. They're more symbolic than substantive, really, I guess, in retrospect. But the links between the, the historic struggles that have gone on in the Middle East and Africa. There are people talking about both, and they're talking about them in concert, people writing about it in concert. Um, but the fact is, everybody's fighting local versions, local origins of neoliberalism. And so the reciprocity that the smart folks in, in different contexts have, uh, have grabbed onto makes a lot of sense. But those are symbolic victories that are significant. Those are big accomplishments. And you guys got the cops on side? Really? <laughs> in some ways, all right? It's conflicted. It's conflicted. But that, that's happened once in Canada in 1919. There was a general strike in Winnipeg. And the cops refused to smash heads. So they all got taken out of the city and they brought in specials to come in and smash heads. Like, that's, that's a big deal. <laughs> so what can we learn from these experiences that's relevant for us here? Could, he, could these kinds of attacks, when we see how blatant this class war is, how, how stark this is, right? Could that happen here? Hands up for those that remember Mike Harris. We didn't think that stuff was possible. We didn't see that coming, right? We didn't think, oh, well, here's their, here's their agenda, and they're going to be able to move this, but we didn't even think of it. So when this stuff kind of comes out of the blue and surprises you, yeah, we're going to be shocked again, and we're going to be indignant again when we look at their record, when we look at Ford, when we look at what, what Hudak's talking about, right? The, the provincial leader for the conservatives. Yes, this could happen here. We're not immune from these kinds of attacks and not immune from these kinds of attacks that go to the core of trade unionism, that, that attack the, the mechanisms that we use to survive as a trade union movement. That they, they will use mechanisms to isolate and attack workers. The $70 an hour auto worker when they were going after the private sector workers, right? These guys made 70 bucks an hour. I spent 12 years in an auto industry. I never made 70 bucks an hour. I wish I did, including all the benefits, man. I would have retired earlier. <laughs> retired. Um, but the idea of like, uh, a privileged worker with a defined benefit pension plan. I'm glad Carolyn mentioned my home city, right? These Stelco workers, it's U.S. Steel now. When U.S. Steel took over that company, they did like press in the local newspaper. The chief financial officer out of Pittsburgh wrote this letter saying, your pensions will be more secure once we take you over because you'll be part of a bigger pool. And then immediately provoke this strike in response to the economic crisis, provoke this strike and say, we're going after your defined benefit pension plan and we're dealing with the indexing for all the retirees. The you have gold-plated pensions was the rhetoric, right? And nobody can survive with those anymore, no company. And then the QB strikes in Toronto and Windsor that people are, are all familiar with. But that's about defining and isolating public sector workers and defining them as privileged, really. Um, and then making the case that, oh, the private sector took a hit, so you guys should take a hit as well. And that, like, Carolyn did a really good job of, I think, articulating why those populist ideas gain traction, why they get ground. Um, but it, again, to use another example of could these attacks happen here, look at the most recent provincial budget, right? There's another couple of thousand jobs they're looking to cut. And they put together this commission for the, Fred Hahn has called it a privatization commission. That they're going to like go through systematically and develop a list of savings and efficiencies. And all of us know exactly what that means throughout the pi uh, public sector. They're looking for billions while simul of cuts while simultaneously continuing along with the corporate tax cuts. The IMF has said that there's going to be a decade of austerity. Get ready for a decade of austerity is what the International Monetary Fund is telling all of us. So in terms of going forward, we need to do the same things as what workers in Wisconsin and students in Wisconsin got to do, which is strengthening those alliances between workers providing services, workers receiving services. Both groups can strengthen their roles in advocating for and increasing social programs. QP and OCAP is a really good local example. Bring, to, uh, bring protection and expansion of those services onto the collective bargaining agenda. Start talking about volume of services at the bargaining table. <clears throat> so bring that stuff right in to the mechanisms and the systems that you already have in place. And then second, to popularize ideas and push ideas about taxes on the wealthy and on corporations. Fred Hahn actually did a really good job on Global right after the, um, 
uh, Global News, on the, and that's not a friendly place for him to go, right? But he can go there, and he's actually doing a great job now, and this is something that we've been weak on, about making the link between the income side and the spending side. So he's saying it's not just about cuts, it's not just about how much we spend, look how much we've cut taxes for these guys, right? Canada has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the OECD. You wouldn't think so when you listen to the federal and provincial leaders. The US has one of the highest, but nobody pays that much. They all pay less than half of that. Only the suckers pay the full amount. So they don't actually have a tax rate that's high, but they say that they do. But deepening that link between progressive taxation and public services, the money's gotta come from somewhere, right? So we need to be talking about that. And then the need to win over private sector workers and their unions as class, as class allies. So deepening again the links between public sector and private sector. There's a reason for that private sector uh, conservatism, and that partly has to do with union density. Yeah, I'm almost done, yeah, thanks. Um, we've seen private sector workers uh, as a strategy, as a strategic response, increasing alliances with the boss um, and accepting more precarious work situations. And it's not a sustainable strategy, right? So finally, contributing to building a movement that argues for a challenge to the underlying system that brought the crisis in the first place. It's back to basics in some ways, right? Building a class-wide orientation that rejects austerity argues that working class people shouldn't pay for the measures taken by the ruling people to get out of the crisis. Again, why should workers pay for the crisis that they didn't have any hand in uh, causing or provoking? And that includes efforts to defend the public sector union, strengthen public programs, specifically the stuff around education materials, but also mobilizing members both of public and private sector unions along with social service recipients, doing that kind of work jointly. And unions and trade union activists are particularly well situated and have the mechanisms already in place to do that kind of work. But in the near term, that work includes building new, stronger mass protests, like we're talking about tomorrow in this context. Um, through the educational, solidarity-based class mobilization, moving towards creative forms of strikes. So that might be strikes in a non-traditional way. That might mean pushing the envelope in slightly different ways in both the public and the private sector, including shutting things down for one day or whatever, right? Um, delivering services in a slightly different way, but using creative tactics, uh, different kind of versions of older tools. And then raising new and more radical demands, uh, extending and democratizing uh, public services. The free and accessible transit campaign is, I think, a, a beautiful example of that. And controlling the financial sector. I was just in the hospital for four days and there's a senior doctor in there making the case to me that the banks should be democratized and that they should be run as a, as a public service. This is a guy who has a lot to lose, but he's making that case when we're talking about the financial crisis. So what I'm saying is that the terrain is there. The terrain is a little bit more open now and the boundaries of what's possible, um, they have shifted a little bit. And we have a genuine thanks to give to workers and students in Wisconsin for pushing those boundaries a little bit. These guys have lit the fire a little bit. These guys have, uh, um, have kind of pushed it open a little bit. And so now our job is to dump a bunch of fuel onto that fire and make sure it gets good and hot. Uh -huh. <laughs>